Uh, my name is Teresa Solomon. But before I go into the background, I'd like to say that it is important for us also to acknowledge the um, forgotten or those who are not being recognized heroes who have played a very important part in the struggle for freedom, but have never been acknowledged in terms of what I'm having to do here now. So I speak, if, you, if I speak about Teresa, it's about many other women who have also been involved in struggle. Yes, I belonged to the young Christian students and then later on to the young Christian workers. And that is where I was exposed to the various cultures in our, in Cape Town, particularly Cape Town, through a church organization. Um, and that was a very important start of my life in terms of um, the future for South Africa. But I was very young, very giddy and dizzy most of the time, but enjoying life up until the time um, in 1974 when my ex-husband was released from Robben Island. Then I became actively involved in the struggle for liberation. Besides being my, my mother as a mentor, she was actually my mentor, besides her influence on my life in terms of the value systems and so forth, mixing with other young people from other cultures also assisted me in looking at the way forward um, for the future of the youth of this country. My mother was actually apolitical but in a way, she was really political. Um, she set the value systems, you know, the basic things, the please, the thank you, the respect, particularly the respect, and um, how do you conduct yourself when you are within a, within a group of young people, young people your own age, and things don't seem to be really gelling because we, we brought up in different environments. And um, so those were the things that she always latched onto. Always respect. Remember your please and your thank yous. Don't be arrogant. And um, ensure that you, you become a friend, genuine friend. And that's what led me to this word comrade. Because a friend and a comrade are two very different things. But she, she led me to that friendship has to be cherished. And that's what we, we have to do in the struggle. We have to cherish our kamaradska. And I was active, very active, like very many of our women, because it was mainly the women that took up the struggles, you know. They were always in the forefront of the struggle. So um, we were detained, detention with our trial. So the question that you're asking me, is um, for me, it's like, if you're detained without trial, what are they detaining you for, you see? And we never knew why they detained us. They didn't say we detain you for X, Y, and Z. No, they didn't do that. So my total years of detention is five years in between, that like solitary confinement as well. Um, yeah, so, so those were, were the issues that we took up. The fact that the washing lines, you know, go to divisional council and say, there's an issue here with the washing lines. You're dividing communities. Pavements, you have no pavements, you're eating sand. Um, wh what are we doing? What are we going to be doing with our children? We need space, safe environment for our children. So then we started creches in the houses of city council and we wrote and asked them permission and we didn't pay rent. And we had little masonets. We had in Ledwood a uh, crescent in, in Taff, Eastridge. We had a crash there. So we, we, we did those types of issues. But in the meantime, we were also educating people in terms of the fact that you have been forced removed. And look where people have removed, the government has removed you. And what are your conditions here? Um, when I was in solitary confinement for five months, I was kept at um, 
Seapoint Police Station, uh, which was, in a way, if I say a, a comfortable detention, I mean particularly to the food we got because they didn't have a um, mess. So they had to get food from the hotels. So um, at one stage, I was also in the same same section where Trevor Mandel was also in solitary confinement. Uh, when I l left, or when I was discharged, or when I was released from solitary confinement, uh, they took me straight to Polsmore Prison. Now, you must try and understand that for five months I never spoke to anybody. And I always had the security police come in to interrogate. Um, so when I got to Polsmore, I was like probably a cat climbing onto my bed, climbing, there's a little uh, cupboard that you have next to the bed, uh, climbing onto the cupboard, trying to communicate with people outside through the windows up there. And um, for about three days, I couldn't stop talking like I'm doing now. I just couldn't stop talking and it was just rambling. And one of, Mildred de Sia actually helped me through this one. And she came to me one day and she said, Comrade, oh, enough is enough. No more talking now. And it was because it was a side effect of a solitary confinement. When I was detained in Middleburg, very short detention, about five days, but the worst detention. Because firstly, they didn't know how to deal with me and they kept on telling the common law prisoners, she thinks she's Mrs. Pusak. And the common law prisoners would walk past my cell and say, do you know what they're saying about you? They say, you're Mrs. Pusak. Um, it was a difficult detention because there I was also in, in the kind of a solitary. It was a filthy cell. It had... Um, we, we knew your rights as a prisoner, and they gave me one blanket, and I said, it's winter, I need five blankets, and they brought the five blankets. And when I got into bed the evening, I had on my, a bush jacket with a check suit. It was very cold, Middleburg's very cold. And I went to get into the bed, slept on the floor on, the, on these mats, and um, what had happened was the whole evening I was just, scratching. And the next morning when I got up, I made up the bed and I looked at this bed and this bed was doing this. It was riddled with white lice. And that is why now, up until now, how many years ago, I can't sleep under a blanket. We knew one day we would be free. And that probably sustained us because we never went for counseling. You know, you were a weakling if you went for counseling, which is not, not a good thing, by the way. Um, and in actual fact, I don't know how I coped. In solitary confinement, I started praying, yes. Um, but I can't say that, that um, this is what helped me cope. I think the main thing was, we're going to be free one day, we have to be doing this. The struggle had escalated. People were becoming, more people were becoming involved in the struggle. The fact that um, we were, we became ungovernable. And that was one of the signs that, that led us to believe that we will be, be free because we put in so much pressure on this government together with sanctions, but we mustn't forget the internal struggles of our communities that were led by women most of the time. I would like to see more young people getting involved. Young people getting involved because the young people are that famous saying, the future. And youth day for me must be every day because our youth, every year there's a 16 year old, 18 year old that's going to vote. You see, and we're losing out of that. You know, I was in Canada as a high commissioner, and I saw how 
these young people were invested in. We don't invest in our youth, by the way. One day on, a, on June the 16th, that's it. The same thing with our women. One day on August the 9th, that's it. We don't invest in them. So if we invest in the youth, and I look at Canada, during summer, the youth play a very important part. If it's, if it's parliament, they go and sit at the steps of inside parliament where the parliamentarians sit, and they're the runners, but in school uniform. They go and fetch the water. They take a note of this one and that one. They become curators of museums. It's amazing. They become the governor general's uh, uh, guards. So why can't we do things like that for, for, for our youth, you know? Shadow. I don't say shadow member of parliament. That's the last person they must shadow. They can rather shadow someone at a swimming pool that becomes a lifesaver or Strandfontein Beach, something where they will get constructive uh, exposure to life.